so that was 18 months of work. With, yeah. With Pete, Pete's help and one or two others. So we, you know, we've had um, an interesting uh, first year and a half. We really started midway through 2018 with Media Monks. And to answer your question, I mean, I didn't want to retire and uh, I wanted to... I think people who retire at uh, sort of my age sort of wither and die quicker. Um, so keeping sort of mental and physical um, health, you need to be uh, engaged. And having port I don't like portfolio, you know, dabbling in and out. Being a non-executive director of a listed company in particular is probably the worst job on earth. And um, so I thought really about, you know, WPP and... You know, we were flatlining. And wh where did I see the growth? Because, you know, there's stuff, if something's flat, there's stuff that's growing, there's stuff that's diminishing, there's stuff that's, that's flat. And there were three areas that struck me as being important from an organic growth perspective. The first was first-party data, which we heard a lot about by BCG. I have to say, actually, that I was amazed that in the BCG work, I, I, I came in halfway through the presentation, I didn't hear anything about the impact of third-party cookies being withdrawn within two years. It's something we must talk about in the course here because it's absolutely fundamental. It drives more to first party data as a result, but we can talk about that. But so first party data, digital content, digital advertising content was the other growth area. And the third was digital media planning and buying. So if you put those three together in what we saw on the film, what we call the Holy Trinity, I don't want to offend anybody in the room, but we call the Holy Trinity, first party data driving the creation of digital advertising content being pumped out programmatically in a circle. I mean, the traditional tentpole model, which the five holding companies embody, is not fit for purpose and not fit for, for format anymore. So at that model, which is an iterative model, it's really a, a, a political electoral campaign model. I mean, if you, if you look at Michael Bloomberg, for example, in his campaign, uh, he won the air war cause, because he spent $500 million or whatever, but he didn't win the ground war. And the ground war in a new media context is really the, the, probably the most important thing. So that there were four principles around, or there are four principles around S4 Capital. Firstly, we're purely digital because that's where the growth is. So when I started at Sarch's, in the, eight, in the late, seven, late 60s, early 70s, it was all about globalization, you know, how companies were globalizing. Uh, when I was at WPP, it was about globalizations and the, be and the beginning of technology. S4 is purely about technology and top-line growth. So the, the media market is about 550 billion to 600 billion. Marketing services is about 500 billion worldwide, and there's about 700 billion in trade budget. So the industry in which we operate is about 1.7, 1.8 trillion. We're really interested in the first bit, the first 550, 600 billion media, and a bit of marketing services. Growth, number one. Number two was the Holy Trinity model. That's the second principle. Number three was faster, better, cheaper, or speed, quality, value. Faster, because agility is key. In, in analog companies, and indeed, I would say, in disruptor companies too, or digital companies, agility is the, is the key attribute that's, that's important. Better means understanding the digital ecosystem. There are about 16 companies, which we might as well list. Google is obviously the, the key one. Facebook, Amazon, uh, Tencent, Alibaba, um, Apple, Microsoft, Adobe, Oracle, Salesforce, IBM, SAP, ByteDance, Baidu, Snap Twitter, those are the 16 that we focus on and we try and allocate, optimize the budgets of our clients in both content and in media from a digital point of view. And the last attribute is a unitary structure. Structure. The thing that bedevils the holding companies is their verticality. I know that horizontality is a word that is now banned inside WPP. But when I used that, what I was trying to say was you have to create one firm. And every one of the five holding companies is trying to get to one firm. We are one firm. We started with a clean sheet of paper 18 months ago, and we've built a business around content and around data and analytics and programmatic, but it's a unitary structure. So Pete runs Mighty Hive, which is our digital 
media planning and buying and programmatic and data and analytics brand and media monks around content. But we're uniting the two and presenting as one. So long answer to your question. Yeah. Apologies for being so long. It's not going to be. I'm so very, passionate <laughs> very passionate about it. Very passionate. Sorry. Thank you so much. So BCD earlier, I think it's a, a, a lot of the speakers have mentioned the importance of first party data. Can you elaborate a little bit on why you think this is so important for brands and for, for marketers? Well, for um, consumers. When you're thinking about it, so since 2008, what's happened? Um, after 2008, the, the emphasis on cost reduction was so severe. You may remember that ZBB, zero-based budgeting, was propagated by consultancies like BCG and McKinsey and others as being the way to go. It'd take cost out of your system. And companies like 3G, ABI, Kraft Heinz, Coty, all emphasized zero-based budgeting. What did that do? That sucked out from companies their marketing resources. So CMOs, you know, under pressure from CFOs and procurement, in a low-growth world, you know, post, what people don't understand, I think, is that post-2008, economic growth has been harder to find. Now, nominal GDP growth is lower post-2008 than before. Why? Because there's less inflation. Therefore, there's less pricing power. There's therefore, there's focus on cost. And the power structures inside corporations generally, CMOs got less power, and let's say CFOs and procurement offices were down here, and they either got up to here or maybe even there, and they were more, more dominant. So after 2008, you saw a drastic reduction in costs inside companies. Being efficient was the primary coefficient and the drive. Around 2016, what happened? The, the wall gardens, the walls in the wall gardens suddenly got bigger. Google, Facebook, Amazon, and others, whether it was because of privacy, interference in elections, whatever the reason, they said, we are not going to share the data with you to the extent that you thought you were going to get it. And our clients, who thought that the internet would give them a direct relationship with the consumers, were faced with a situation where the Walmart, Tesco, and Carrefour were replaced by the e-tailers. And what they started to decide to do is to establish a direct connection with the consumer and start to take back control. There is an eerie correlation between what's happening in marketing departments and the, the UK Brexit voter who wanted to take back control. So you've got these two forces at work here which were driving clients to become more and more concerned about what was going on. Therefore, first party data and knowing what your, your clients are doing or your consumers are doing is absolutely critical. So this strategy that clients are em employing of a sort of bricks and clicks strategy to, uh, to accumulate first party data. So for example, Nest, you know, we've worked on, you saw on the film, Nestle Starbucks. Star Nestle pays Starbucks $7 billion for the, the cap retail capsule, retail format, small retail formats, plus the capsules. Why did it do that? To establish a direct relationship. Through their stores, they collect data. Through online, they collect data. They have a line through Amazon. They have a line through their, their own websites. Christian Dior perfumes in China, 200 stores which get information on, on buyers through their stores. Dior.com, they get information online through their for, from their customers. They also have a, a separate line through Amazon.com as well. So this bricks and clicks, Unilever buys Dollar Shave Club. Why do they do that? Not to compete with Procter on Gillette. That's not the primary purpose. It's to get first party data. So this is a critical battleground. I think the BCG data was very good in really underlining how important this is. Collating the data, synthesizing the data. Often these companies, you know, grown by acquisition or they have different platforms and it's very difficult to synthesize it. So this is, this is the control of that data mm. is the critical battleground that we're, that we're going through. Yeah. And another thing you talk a lot about is the importance of agility within organizations. Yeah. But I'm actually going to pass this question to Pete. <laughs> what would you say are the key steps that an organization needs to take to go through a, a digital transformation? Well, let's first start with the underlying reasons why all this is necessary. And it has actually very little to do with 
privacy regulations and cookies and things like that. It has everything to do with the changing relationship and expectations that consumers have for advertising as a result of their changing media experience. Remember, for the first time in history these days, everybody in this room and the co consumers that we all chase together has a fundamentally different media experience. They can watch anything they want, read anything they want, listen to anything they want, and that expectation of relevance and perfection and personalization obviously applies to the other stuff that comes through the exact same screens right next to the content. That means that our advertising has to fundamentally change. We shouldn't think about campaigns anymore. We should think about conversations. And that's hard to do when you're talking about having like intelligent conversations with a billion people simultaneously. That's not easy, but that's exactly what they expect. And so against that backdrop, how can you have any sort of hope of getting there if you have no memory? At the end of the day, that's what first party data is, a record of all of the interactions that you have had with your customer. And if they're expecting a conversation and you're not, doing a first, you're not using your first party data, then you show up to every conversation clueless. And it's just pointless and it's boring and this is why consumers are so fed up, not with advertising, but with stupid advertising. And so when you're looking at it from that perspective, the, the promise of first party data really brings three things. Number one, first and foremost, personalization. The ability to continue that conversation and say something meaningful to me based upon what I did with you yesterday, not based upon the fact that I happen to be one of a billion people in a targeting group somewhere. Number two, it brings you attribution. Our industry has been bedeviled for over a century with the inability, generally speaking, to understand whether or not this stuff worked or not, right? The fundamental tension between CFOs and CMOs have always been about, hey, I get it, you guys do something in, that's very important, you attract new customers, but can you please show me what the ROI percentage is? And we've never really been able to do that, and we're finally on the, cu the cusp of being able to do that with things like Google do doing, with Ads Data Hub, and the various marketing clouds that are out there. But at the end of the day, what you need is some first-party data that includes just two simple things, who bought what and who saw which ads. Once you have those data sets, then you can actually start meaningfully measuring whether this is working or not. And as they say, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And so that's the second thing that comes inside of there. And the third thing that comes on top of all of this is just the general fact that you must be able to react quickly. And this is the agility and the speed. And now we're going to get to your question. What do you really need to do about this stuff? Number one, you have to get your data in line. There is zero points in establishing like advanced marketing practices if all you're going to do is say something stupid. Get your data in line, and that means that you have to do the hard work. And it's not sexy, it's not glamorous, but absolutely necessary. Go back through and do an inventory of every single data set that's out there, and make sure that they actually connect with each other. The most frustrating thing that happens for CMOs of global firms is that they don't get a single report of what's going on around the world. They get 50 reports, all a little bit different from each other, all a little bit sort of crazy, and then you sit there, and how can you make decisions Right, when you don't even have a single clear view of what's going on. You must get your data in order, and it's not rocket science, but it is absolutely necessary from there. Then you must start to think about things in terms of the transformations that are necessary for this. You have to have agility, data, and speed at its heart. I'm not saying that every company in the world has to in-house, but I am saying that every single company in the world has to transform in some way, shape, or form in order to keep up with a consumer who simply expects more. And by the way, that delta is growing faster every day because the consumer is sprinting away from us. They say that people underestimate the impact of, uh, overestimate the impact of technology in the short term and wildly underestimate it in the long term. And I think that that is entirely correct here. I really don't think that most marketers and most corporations understand the magnitude of the changes that are coming, they're going to be fundamental. We're not just talking about adding a new process or two. We're talking about blowing up industry norms and perhaps even reshaping the very structures of the industries themselves. For example, inside of the CPG world, CPG was a great industry structure, right, when you had a world where you could kind of like maybe not have a direct relationship with the consumer. And so they could like, you know, use the retailers as distribution points. But the entire DTC thing is now showing that maybe you do need that data. And by the way, is it going to be a case of, you know, the 
um, CPG companies making the most of the data that they can get? Yeah, sure, that's step one. But is that really going to be the winning strategy longer term? Who knows? But that's the level of questions that we should be thinking about, right? How do we fundamentally reformat how these entire businesses run? And all of those things are going to be underlying one underlined by a single thing. You must be able to measure the results inside of your advertising. It must be done not just three or four times a year, but three or four times a day so that you can kind of do experiments and rapidly iterate towards this stuff. And that's what Mighty Hive does. We are not just in the business of media, we're in the business of digital transformation from the ground up. And our favorite cases are when we have customers who not only understand this, but passionately believe that it's either do this or be vanquished. Yeah, just on the question about you know, who's best for this. So I, we would classify companies as in twofold. You can say that analog and digital, but I prefer Glenn Hutchins' of, uh, uh, <laughs> definition of, of disrupted and disruptors. Disruptors are relatively easier for us to deal with. Disruptors, uh, best way I can put it is their eyes are looking upwards. Dis disrupted, they're looking down at their boots. And with disrupted companies, where we work most effectively is where we have change agents, where we have people and I probably shouldn't name them, but we have people within companies who are trying to disrupt the status quo. You know, and I would admit, when I was at WPP, um, what you tended to do, you know, you promised the street or the city that you would, you know, revenue targets, you know, making money in the old-fashioned way, cash, EPS, profitability and the like. And you had your analog business and you made promises. And if you, and you were experimenting over here, with the digital businesses and, and your new ways of working. On a left WPP, we calculated that something like 40% of our 20 billion of revenue was in digital in one way, shape, or form. But the analog business, if it faltered, what did you do? You put more pressure on the analog business. You know, look at the automotive companies at the moment. If they're missing their targets, as most of them are doing, the traditional ones are, you know, in competition with a Tesla or an Elon Musk, what do they do? They cut costs. And they freeze, they freeze the existing business. And the existing business is put into an even more of a straitjacket. Ariana Huffington has a wonderful saying. She says, you know, failure is not the opposite of success, it's the platform to success. And I think she's dead right. So you but what you fail to do, particularly in the short term issues, because all of us who are involved in listed companies, whereas uncontrolled listed companies put too much emphasis on the short term, because the average life of a CEO is five years. Average life of a CMO is two years. So trying to get that balance between the short and the long term is impossibly difficult, unless you have control of the company, like they do at Google, or Facebook, or Amazon, or indeed at S4. So we're, we're prepared to make the long term decisions because we have control and we're not, you know, if you have a lunatic in charge, you have a problem. But you, know, you make the decisions for the long term. Critical issue. So there, I think you make that distinction. Um, it's where we find the change agents that we get the greatest track. And I think that one of the things that... We're not going to stop. You yeah, know, I the say over time. <laughs> Andrew, over time. <laughs> Pete, go on. A quick <laughs> one. I'm just going to say one thing. I'm never going to get these people out of stage. <laughs> Pete, go for it. Yeah. I think that there has been an, a very interesting change in marketing services over the last, call it three to five years. And if, you know, I'm sitting next to the guy who's been through all of these changes, and we've confirmed this, but let's be clear about this. There was a time when marketing services and media services in particular were commoditized. It was figured out, you know, we know how to buy TV correctly, we know how to buy newspapers correctly, we know how to do these things correctly, and so therefore the procurement departments of the world did exactly what they were supposed to do. If A is equal to B is equal to C in terms of quality and output, then just beat people up on price because that's the only th differentiator that there is. I agreed with that strategy when it was appropriate. Here's the, here's the update. There are now huge questions that are out there. There are now massive answers that have yet to be sort of found, and there are massive differences in quality. And that means that you are going to get what you pay for, not get the best deal possible and hope for the best. You're not buying sugar, in other words. Yeah. 
And so there really is sort of an opportunity here. And the people that we see are the ones that understand that this is not about trying to be efficient on a cost. This is about fundamental transformational bets that are going to lay the groundwork for decades of success. And is that something that you really want to shortchange and underinvest in for a couple of pennies? No. I think we will end with those very smart <laughs> words. Thank you so much, gentlemen.